Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Professor Avinash Dadich and uh, students today I am going to share very interesting new regulator in India which is Competition Commission of India. So, today we will talk about the competition law and uh, how competition law is useful for uh, companies and individuals as well as for the market and consumers and why a business manager should know about competition law. So, first talk about the competition law and economy. A vibrant and effective competition law framework is essential for the growth of any economy. It helps in regulating a fair market devoid of any anti-competitive practices that cause harm to the consumers as well as to the businesses. What we want in market? We want a fair game, it is just like a game we, when you go and play football, you want to play with fair rules and regulations and you want to win or lose as per your strength and the opposite party or the competitor should not do anything which is not fair, which is not appropriate. So, equal playing field should be there. That is why competition law is there, that there should be competition in market. So, competition law is basically is a tool to maintain balance in the market by ensuring that few prominent players do not single handedly run the show. We do not want that a big player, a big guy, big company starts you know abusing its dominant position uh, towards the competitor, the small competitors as well as towards the consumers. And market should rather operate in a manner wherein the practices do not lead to barriers to entry for small businesses or lead to unfair uh, burden being put on businesses. We want that small businesses should also flourish and sometime when the market is very much monopolized by big companies or some companies they make a cartel they make an informal agreement and they start doing some anti-competitive activity, activities like price fixing, uh, market uh, dividation. So, these type of activities really creates problem for competitors as well as for the consumers. So, let us see how competition law evolves in India. So, when India got uh, freedom in 1947, that time there was no competition law in India. And uh, I must tell you one thing that uh, United States started their antitrust or they say competition law in 1889 okay. and the European Union they started competition law in 1957. So, India was also following the same development and gradually they developed MRTP uh, Monopolies and Respect, uh, Restrictive Trade Practices Act 1969. So, MRTP the old law of competition law was framed on the basis of socialist ideas and philosophies because as you know that time we were following the socialist way of doing business, the government was giving license to only few firms. So, government was even creating monopolies in market. Okay. So, the idea was that the MRTP should curb and restrict formation of monopolies in the market. It was considered that any such concentration of power in a free market in the hands of a few will hamper the economic growth and interest of the consumer and thus must be restricted. So, the idea was that you know as per our directive principle of Indian constitution article 39 the power and the wealth should not be concentrated into few hands, it should be equally distributed 
and the people must have opportunity to do business. Okay. However, the MRTP did not bring much outcome in Indian market, because that time very few private players were engaged in market as you know the because of the regulatory ecosystem, license raj, closed economy. So, MNCs were not operating in India before 1990, very few, very few and in a very restricted manner. So, MRTP did not bring too much outcome because market was absolutely closed, very few players were allowed even by the government of India and finally, the MRTP did not have any provisions of penalty. So, in even in those cases where the uh, MRTP commission found that this particular company or the group of companies they have done something wrong as per the competition law the MRTP commission could not impose any penalty. So, in absence of any teeth, in absence of any deterrence, MRTP could not bring any outcome. So, then Indian market opened in 1991, we became the part of WTO in 1995 and then there was a debate that now we need a good market regulator. Students, please remember the Competition Commission of India is a market regulator, is not a sectorial regulator. So, please try to understand the difference between a sectorial regulator and market regulator. Sectorial regulator deals with a particular sector like for example, RBI, it deals with banking, SEBI, it deals with security market or uh, IRDA deals with the insurance market. Okay. So, they have very limited objective, but when I say competition commission of India, it deals with the entire market, it has nothing to do with a particular sector. So, the idea was that now the India is opening its economy, MNCs will come and they want a fair competitive market as per the uh, standards of the European and American markets. So, in 1999, the government of India appointed Raghavan committee and Raghavan committee recommended a new competition law and the idea was that this law should be modern, this law should have some power to create some impact. So, in 2002, the Competition Act 2002 was introduced to cover the inadequacies of MRTP and to serve as an effective legislature to promote fair trade practices in the Indian market. So, MRTP was repealed and the new competition act was enacted. So, let us see what it objective you know what the preamble of this act says. The objective of this act can be further gathered from its preamble. So, whenever you read any law if you want to understand that what is the objective of this law then you need to read the preamble is the first few lines of any act. So, the act says the preamble says that this act an act to provide keeping in view of economic development of the country. So, the first objective is economic growth of the country. For the establishment of the competition, a commission to prevent practices having adverse effect on competition. So, all those ac business activities which can create some adverse impact on the competition, they should be stopped and this law is to promote and sustain competition in market. So, it is not only that it stops anti-competitive activities and protect competition, even it promotes competition. For what? For whom? To protect the interest of consumers and to ensure freedom of trade carried on by other participants in the market. So, you want freedom, you know, you do not want that now, because of the behavior of some other competitor or a big party, big company, uh, you cannot do your business, you know. So, that behavior is restricting your freedom, okay. So, that is a very larger goal. So, Indian competition law talks about consumer welfare, market welfare, business welfare, economic development. So, it is quite ambitious law. So, this law basically deals with three situations, anti-competitive agreements under section 3 of the act, abuse of dominant position that is under section 4 of the act and combinations under section 5 and 6 of the act.
So, let us first try to understand the institutional framework. Okay. So, whenever you read any law, especially the regulatory law, then you need to understand the institutional framework of that particular law. So, when I say RBI, RBI Act is there, SEBI Act is there, but then you need to understand how SEBI, how RBI uh, really work in real life. Okay. So, in here they have set up a commission that is called Competition Commission of India. And then the appeal from Competition Commission of India goes to National Companies Law Appellate Tribunal, NCLT. Earlier it was Competition Appellate Tribunal, but now the government of India merged many tribunals and now this company, National Companies Law Appellate Tribunal deals with the appeal from the CCI. And finally, uh, appeal from NCLT goes to the Supreme Court. So, in this case there is no intervention of any district court or any high court, it is a CCI, NCLT and then Supreme Court. Okay. And uh, CCI also undertakes lot of competition advocacy provisions. So, like as I said it promotes competition, so it creates lot of awareness in market you know to create competitive environment. So, first understand what is competition law. I just you know gave the basic understanding of competition law, but let us see what is competition law. Co competition law or the competition word is not been defined in the Competition Act 2002. Normally, the law likes to define all the important provisions, important words, but here they have not defined the competition word. So, competition is basically a branch of economic law. When I say economic law means that when you talk about competition law, you talk about economics, you talk about business, you talk about market. So, it is not a pure legalistic law, it is not about IPC, CRPC, CPC, it is very much commercial aspects of the market. Okay. And when you do analysis under competition law, then you use lot of market theories driven by economics, driven by accountancy and uh, so many uh, new ideas of business management. So, this is that is why I say it is economic law, it means ki it has a multidisciplinary approach. And what it does? It governs the behavior of the enterprises or the companies and market participants. So, the behavior how they are be, how they are playing with each other. See, as I said, when you go to play a game, you want to win and somebody has to lose. It is not about that everybody will win, everybody will lose, but the idea is when they play, they should play with some rules and regulations. There should not be any fall game, you know. So, the CCI governs the behavior, the behavior should be appropriate. If they are following right behavior and because of their efficiency, because of their quality, uh, if they win the market, CCI has nothing to do with that. Producers of goods and services fairly compete with each other, that is the very important thing. You know, the competition law says to all mar market participants, the guys please compete. You know, you cannot be friend, because if you become friend, then ultimately consumer will suffer, ultimately competitor will suffer. So, for your own benefits, if you collude, that is not acceptable. Okay? So, competition law says very clearly that you have to compete. And how we define competition law or competition situation? So, World Bank definition is very relevant here. It says that competition is a situation in a market in which firms or sellers independently strive for the buyers. So, all of them are working independently and they are looking for new buyers. So, in order to achieve business objective, for example, profit, sales or market share. So, what they are looking for, companies are looking for profit, they are looking for sales, they are looking for market share. So, they are working independently for the common objective, that, that is the competitive process. So, how CCI starts in, in investigation? Suppose if two, as I said, any company, big company or some group of companies, they start doing some illegal anti-competitive activities. So, then uh, we can go to the CCI. So, when I say you can go to CCI, it means that competition law 
or the regulatory framework can be an opportunity as well as a threat. How it can be an opportunity? Threat we understand very well that if your company is doing something wrong, the competitor, the consumer, the government can go before the CCI and the CCI will start investigation against your company. But that is a threat. How it can be opportunity? It can be opportunity when you understand that my competitor is not allowing me to do business in a fair terms and conditions because of its uh, the competitor size or some other advantage uh, you are not able to compete with him because the competitor is using its dominance to kick you out to exploit you to exploit you or the con con customer but you can't do anything you know because it's a very wild market very crude market in that scenario you can go to the cci file case against your competitor and CCI will give you option, CCI will give you solutions of this market failure. So, this is an opportunity as well as, so CCI can start investigation by three means. First is information received under section 19.1a. So, you need to understand that competition law does not talk about complainant, there is no complainant, all are informant. Informant means that if you believe that that party is doing something wrong, even if you are not affected by that behavior, okay, you can go before the CCI and provide the information. Okay. And to provide the information, you have to like if you want to be a formal informant, then you have to pay 5000 rupees for an individual and 50,000 for a company. But that means that CCI just receives the information and then you are free. If you want to provide more information, you provide. If you do not want to provide more information or if you do not have enough information, more information, that is not the issue. CCI will do their own investigation and they will find uh, relevant data. The second can be reference received from central or state government. So, sometime it happens that when the bid rigging is happening, see the bid rigging, I, I, we will talk more about bid rigging, but I just give you some basic uh, understanding. Bid rigging is basically suppose the tender, like the government issues a tender that we want to build a road okay, and uh, we want to have the bids, you know tenders. So, suppose there are only 5 or 6 eligible uh, uh, bidders, instead of competing they decide to collude and they bid for a higher price. So, like for example, the competitive price of that bid should be for example, 5000 crore. Okay. But to collude, they say the lowest buyer, lowest bidder will put 7000 crore, then 7500, 8000, 9000, 10000, in that scenario, the government does not have any option but to accept the lowest bidder that is a 7000, but that 7000 is not a competitive price, it is a it is a bid rigging. Okay. In that scenario, the government can send an information to the CCI, a reference you can say and the CCI will do start investigation because the concerned officer will come to know very quickly that this is a bid rigging case, you know, because they also do their internal assessment what should be the regional price of building this road. If they say 5000, if the lowest bidder is 7000, it means and all other bidders are above 7000, it is a huge gap, then they can go before the CCI and CCI will do investigation and Suomoto also. CCI does not need any information, if they believe there is something wrong happening in market, they can start their own investigation. Okay? So, power of CCI what CCI can do, like obviously we will talk about more investigation, but ultimately as a business person you want to know that what is your threat, what is your risk, okay? what this regulatory body can do against me. So, cease and desist order, they can pass a cease and desist order means ki please stop, do not repeat, do not do it, do not repeat it, that is the first thing. Penalty up to 10 percent of the average turnover for last three year, three preceding financial years. So, that is a huge amount. Suppose, if your company's revenue is turnover is 100 crore rupees, so last three years 300 crore rupees. 
so penalty can go up to 10 percent that's a 30 crore rupees so for given a financial year if your revenue is 30 crore uh, 100 crore and you have to pay 30 crore rupees as a penalty that can be a disaster for your finance okay for your audit books and this 10 percent is basically for abuse of dominance if you are making a cartel if you are uh, collaborating with your competitors if you are doing a bid rigging then this can go up to 10 percent of turnover the same thing or three times of the profit for each year of the continuance of such agreement whichever is higher so suppose uh, through the bid rigging or through anti-competitive agreements you have made maybe uh, 50 crore rupees so cci can go up to 150 crore rupees as a penalty so that can be again a huge penalty on you okay and uh, they can also modify the agreements if the cci believes that this agreement is anti-competitive agreement they can give direction uh, to concerned parties and the concerned parties have to change their agreements in the case of dominant position they can also divide the enterprises it happened with the Microsoft in 1998 the uh, American competition authority issued a direction that the Microsoft should be divided into three companies okay so all these three companies will be doing their separate business okay and power to issue interim orders okay so these can be the and finally the compensation a person may move on application to NCLT to adjudicate upon claim for compensation that may arise from the finding of the commission so compensation is very important suppose in this bid rigging process only uh, for the bid rigging the company and the government is paying them 7000 okay now they are taking services from other vendors like suppose they are buying cement now they are all colluded they say okay, okay we will not pay you the competitive price we will give you 20 percent less and if you do not want to sell your cement that is fine because we are the only buyers in the market. In that scenario that cement company can go before the CCI and ask for the compensation ok. Then there are some miscellaneous provisions like the reference by the statutory authority we have already done reference by the commission. Commission can also give reference to other regulatory bodies like RBI, CB, IRDA, CIA and all these things. Then there is a very interesting provision that is extra territorial jurisdiction. This provision says that if any anti competitive practice happens outside of India, but which is having impact in Indian market, then CCI can intervene. So, for example, if you make a cartel in Switzerland, okay, you are sitting in Switzerland, you are making a cartel agreement in Switzerland. But because of your cartel, because of your anti-competitive practice, Indian market is being affected. In that scenario, CCI does have extra territorial jurisdiction. Okay? And appearance before the commission, it works like a civil court. They issue proper summons and you have to go and appear before the CCI. Fine. Then leniency provision and confidentiality. Leniency provision we will talk later on, but confidentiality is very important. Suppose you want to go and file a case before the CCI and but you do not want to disclose your name uh, or you do not want to disclose your documents to the public, you can ask for the confidentiality. Okay? So, what are the benefits of competitive market in the economy? So, competition improves purchasing power. How? Suppose for a anti-competitive market if I say this pain uh, because of the anti-competitive price that uh, the I am paying 20 percent more price for this pen the competitive price should be maybe 100 rupees but I am paying 120 rupees so it means that 20 rupees are going out of my pocket extra if there is a competitive market then I can buy something more from this 20 rupees and more competition means greater choice and more services okay because when there is a competition companies they do compete with each other on quality on services more options so that's good for the consumer and innovation competitive growth you know innovation happens when there is a competition if there is no competition companies why they would like to launch a new product 
Suppose if I believe that there is no competitor and we are all working together, I think no company would like to introduce the next generation technology because they would like to work on the existing technology and make more and more money. So, to push them in a competitive uh, race and competitive are uh, you know fighting with each other competition is required. Okay? So, let us talk about these three provisions anti-competitive agreement and abuse of dominance first. So, what is an agreement under Indian competition law? So, agreement does not need to be right in writing. Okay? Sometimes you business people you think uh, the agreement means until and unless it is not in, in writing, it is not an agreement. No, that is not the situation. Under competition law, agreement can be arrangement, understanding, action or uh, whether in writing or not or whether intended to be legally enforceable or not. Because an agreement one of the condition under Indian contract act is that agreement must be legally enforceable. If I say okay, I will buy, I will sell you 1 kg cocaine okay, or one uh, some illegal weapon or something illegal and if I do not fulfill my promise, you cannot go to court and ask the court that please ask him to fulfill his con uh, contract obligation because that agreement itself is illegal. Okay? But in this case, this contract is illegal, but as per the competition law, we consider it as a contract, as an agreement. Okay? So, there are two types of anti-competitive agreements, horizontal agreement and vertical agreement. So, horizontal agreement, when I say the companies are working at the same level, okay? like the Vodafone and Airtel, Vodafone and Jio, they are, they, are, they are working at the horizontal level like A, B, C, D, they are all working together, they are all competing with each other. So, that is a horizontal agreement. Vertical agreement is like the Jio, then the vendor, then the supplier, then you know there is a vertical integration like for example, if I go and buy shoes then there is a producer, there is a distributor, there is a retailer. So, there is a chain of people who are providing that product or service. So, that is a vertical agreement, the agreement between a, a retailer versus producer. Okay. So, this agreement can also create some anti-competitive effects. So, let us talk first horizontal agreements, they are the most dangerous one. Because when I say horizontal agreement means they are all working at the same level, they are the competitor, they must fight with each other, they must kill each other, but instead they start working together. And why they start working together? Because it kills the competition, it ensures profit, it ensures sales, it ensures growth for them. Okay? So, like for example, as I said this pen may be the 100 rupees and they are competing, the other guy say okay, I will uh, sell at the 95, okay. this is good for me as a consumer. But once they start colluding with each other, they say okay, uh, we will fix our price and the, this pen will be sold at rate of 120, all of us will sell only at 120. Now, as a consumer, I do not have any option, I have to pay 120 rupees, so that is a problem okay. and they all win money. And as a consumer, I have no option. So, what types of horizontal agreement they can make? Directly or indirectly determining purchase or sell price. So, both say purchase and sell. Purchase can also be a cartel, like suppose uh, all five companies competing with each other, they are buying a raw material from someone, and obviously, they want to save money. In that scenario, they can meet, they can fix, okay, we will pay only 80 rupees per kg to this guy. Okay. Right now, we are paying 100, but we all decide that 80 rupees the highest price. And now, we are the only one who can buy this raw material from him. So, that vendor, that supplier does not, does not have any option. Ultimately, he has to sell at 80 rupees to all. So, again this is good for those five guys, but not good for that person, because in the absence of competition, these people can fix price. Sell is very easy like okay, like the 120 rupees example, 
So, that is the one thing sale and purchase. Then second could be limit or control production. They say okay the right now the mark the demand in the market for this pen for example, is maybe 1, uh, 1 million like 10 lakhs pen uh, are required in market the demand is only 10 lakh. So, do one thing let us produce only 7 lakh. So, now you understand very easily because you are the student of management and business demand and supply fix the price. So, if supply is less demand is more they can automatically increase price and make their more profit. In the absence of any uh, agreement they will all produce more and more okay, but in this case they can fix production and this is how they can make more money supply is the same market they can uh, limit the market technical development and so on. So, share the market by way of allocation of geographical area that is very easy like okay, you sell this pain in UP, I will sell this pain in MP, you sell this in Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab, North, South, East, West and we will not compete with each other, we will not enter into that domain like suppose if I am authorized to sell uh, not legally, it is an MP, it is a illegal people can go to CCI, but to ensure my profit I say ok, I am only the person who will sell this pen in UP and you will sell in Karnataka. So, I will not enter into Karnataka, you will not enter into UP and this is how we will make money ok. So, this is the allocation of geographical market that is that is very much uh, simple and uh, CCI and competition law prohibits it. Bid rigging, collusive bidding as I explained you earlier this is very simple fine. So, CCI uses shall presume rule applies to horizontal agreements. So, if companies are involved in any types of such agreement then CCI will believe this is the violation of section 3 and the burden of proof is on the person or enterprise they have to prove that they have not done it ok. So, normally we call them cartel. Okay. So, if you are engaged in any type of horizontal agreement with your competitors we call it them cartel and we have already done this uh, penalty provision. Let us see how we can identify whether the bid rigging has happened or not because all the bid rigging cartelization they work in a very secretive manner you know there is no public meeting they work in a very very secretive manner. So, these are the indicators of bid rigging. The first is small number of companies if uh, eligible bidders are only 6, 6 or 5 or 4 then it is easy to collude. If the eligible bidders are suppose 60 then it is very difficult to collude with each other you know coming to the mutual terms and conditions. Little or no entry very few companies are uh, coming in this market. Market condition is such that very few firms can operate in the market industry associations. So, all this uh, repetitive bidding that like for example, this road. So, the people in uh, in this particular sector they are putting the bids very in repetitive manner they are putting maybe bid in, in MP, in UP, in Haryana, then Karnataka, Maharashtra. So, all big companies engaged in a particular business they are putting their bids everywhere. So, that is why they start knowing each other very easily. Second very interesting which is very important for you people especially the business managers that information exchange is prohibited. Information exchange means sharing commercially sensitive business information with your competitors. So, like for example, if you say why do not we increase the wholesale price by 5 percent you go and meet one of your competitor and you say ok why do not we increase the wholesale price by 5 percent. So, you are sharing some information you are sharing an a suggestion. So, if that guy increases 5 percent you also increases 5 percent. So, this is how like a, an agreement as I said na, agreement does not mean to be in writing even it is an understanding that if you increase by 5 percent I will also increase by 5 percent. So, no one will lose any business. Then uh, you can say discuss about customer and territory with competitors like the West district of A city is my territory do not sell your product in my territory. 
if you just go and inform a competitor that I am planning to invest a lot of money and I want to sell my product in Mumbai, okay, and I am not interested to business in Delhi anymore where you are very active. So basically you are giving an indicator that okay, I am focusing in Mumbai, you focus in Delhi and we will not fight with each other. And you can contact with your formal boss or organization on the same client business. So that can be tricky. So you can just say, okay, I didn't know you are also working for the same client. Why don't we keep in touch and exchange information? That can be a problem for you as well as for your company. Vertical agreements can be manufacturer versus dealer, dealer versus supplier, wholesaler versus retailer. So these can be the example of uh, vertical agreements. Following agreements are prohibited under Indian competition law. So the tie-in arrangement, exclusive supply arrangement, exclusive distribution arrangement, refusal to deal, resale price maintenance. So these are the things which can create problem. Like for example, tie-in arrangement. If I say, if you want to buy my pen, you have to buy, uh, like I say, you know, shoes from me. There is no correlation. I, you can ask me, okay, you have to buy, sell ink from me because from the quality purpose, this ink is much required. But if, I st if you start selling some product or service with the existing product and service without any economic and technical justification, in that scenario, this tie-in arrangement type of things can be prohibited. Okay? Exclusive supply ar ar arrangement, you say, okay, you will only supply to me. Okay, you cannot supply to my competitor. If you want to sell your product to me, then you can't sell your product to my competitor. So that type of agreement can be a problem. Same thing, distribution and refusal to deal. Resale price maintenance is a very good example. Uh, recently, Maruti was uh, penalized on the same issue. So resale price maintenance that, okay, I fix the price. You know, I am the distributor, you are the retailer or I am the manufacturer, you are the dealer and I say, okay, this is the price. Uh, like I give you 100 rupees and you cannot sell this, uh, this product not less than 100 and more than 105. So I fix the price, you know, even for the manufacturer, even for the retailer and dealer. So this resale price maintenance can be an issue. The leniency provision, this is very important. The act provides for imposition of lesser penalty by the CCI where a person takes full, true and vital disclosure of the cartel to the CCI. Suppose you are involved in a cartel, okay, you are working all together, you know, you are fixing price, you are uh, uh, dividing market, you are doing full time cartel business. But then you realize that now maybe this cart, someone is cheating in this cartel, I want to be out of this cartel. So what to do? In that scenario, CCI gives you an option. The option is leniency provision. The leniency provision says that if you provide full, true and vital disclosure of a cartel to the CCI, you can be exempted from the penalty. So this leniency system is target, targeted at cartel participants and seeks to induce participants to break rank and turn approval. It's like a criminal case, you know, in criminal case also we have a concept of approval. If two guys, they commit a crime, if one guy comes to the police and say, okay, I will give you full evidence, I will give you testimony against that uh, person, then as per the criminal law, the approval, the police approval can get less penalty. Same rule applies here in competition law. So the first guy, uh, who goes to the CCI, he gets 100 percent, like no penalty at all on him. Second guy goes 50 percent and third and so forth, they get 30 percent. So the idea is that more and more people should go to CCI and confess that, okay, I have done something wrong, I want to cooperate with you, please do not take action against me and you can take action against the competitors. Then abuse of dominance, that is an anti-competitive agreement when the few companies are working, few competitors are working together. Here abuse of dominant case, uh, it is a single party, okay, dominant position, uh, how, to, how to say someone is dominant? 
someone is dominant when a company operates independently of competitive forces prevailing in the market when a company doesn't worry about the competitor they say okay we are too big that our competitors can't do anything against us and having this philosophy having this confidence the affects its competitors and consumers okay they exploit their com competitors and consumers because they know that nobody can touch us you know we are too big and all my competitors are so small they cannot do anything against me so types of abuses so one is exploitative abuse in this type of abuse uh, you can say you can impose unfair or discriminatory conditions okay so you want to exploit your consumer you want to exploit your competitors second is exclusionary abuse conduct which interferes with a competitive process like for example ma making conclusion of the contract subject to acceptance of sub supplementary obligations because you are too big if someone wants to buy a product from you you are the only one in the market and you say okay uh, put this thing in your contract that uh, for next 10 years you will buy only from me okay if you are not ready i will not sell you right now so you are even foreclosing the future competitor uh, uh, future competition and you are killing all the existing and upcoming competitors denial of market access you say okay if you want to do business with me uh, but i don't want to do business with you okay so you denial the market limiting production of goods pro provision of services scientific development because you are too big and you can do it okay factors to determine how to determine uh, dominant position that whether someone is dominant or not dominance has been traditionally defined in terms of market share of the enterprise or group of enterprise concerned uh, the market share is very important in dominance but as, as i say it's not the conclusion it's only one strong indicator there are some other indicators also however a number of other factors play an important role in determining the influence okay like for example these are the factors market share the size and resource of the enterprise size and importance of the competitors economic power of comp uh, enterprise vertical integration dependence of consumer on the enterprise extent of entry and entry barrier so all these factors you know when you see students you need to understand first you need to establish someone is dominant if someone is dominant then only you can talk about abuse of dominance okay so first you need to establish that particular company particular firm is dominant in the market and then which market you are talking about are you talking about relevant product market or relevant geographic market so these are interesting two concepts so when you say relevant product market then you say okay first we need to narrow down the product like i cannot say that the car car is not a market in the car industry maybe different types of cars like the small cars suv car luxury cars you know all different types of car so when i say small car like a small car means the price below 5 lakh or 4 lakh so then obviously you are not talking about mercedes or other expensive od and other types of car so in that particular market whether that company is dominant or not so even the product this is a possibility that a company is dominant may be overall but not dominant in a particular area okay this is possibility like for example if i say uh, tata for example tata or maybe other companies they are very big but they are not dominant in any market because there are so many competitors and they are fighting with each other okay so first you need to define the product market then in the product market you have to decide the geographic market also so in geographic market i say okay whether you are dominant in south part of india north part of india east part of india so you need to define the market okay and after defining the market then only you can talk about dominance so once you know that someone is dominant then you can go for the abuse of dominance exploitative dominance uh, abuse or uh, exclusionary uh, abuse of dominance so let's see one case law this is very simple dlf case 
So in this case, DLF imposed so, uh, various clauses in buyer's agreement and action of cancelling allotment, forfeiting deposits, keeping buyers in the dark about the eventual shape, size, location, earns money, installment, timely payment and all these things, you know, they put that in, a, in their agreement. The DLF, as you know, DLF is one of the uh, biggest uh, builder in NCR and mainly they are very much active in Gurgaon market. So, in this case, uh, this Mongolia Flat Owners Association, they went to the CCI and they say it, the DLF's agreement terms and conditions are abusive, they are unfair, they are one-sided and DLF is abusing its dominant position. So, then market, the, the first question uh, arose that what is the market here? Because the argument of the DLF was that if you are not happy with my terms and conditions, do not buy from me, just go and buy someone else. You know, if you can go and buy other uh, products and services in the market, then I am not dominant. So, the CCI said no. In this market, the market is provision of services of development of high end residential flats. The Mongolia flat owners, this particular society, only flats more than 3 CR, they were there. So, if I want to buy Mercedes or I want to buy an expensive house and if that company is abusing its dominant position, I will not go and buy a Maruti or I will not buy a house of 20 lakh because all consumers are different. Yeah, please try to understand. All consumers are different, their preferences are different, their budget is different. So, in this case, the argument of CCI was that no, these people wanted to buy an expensive luxury flat in Gurgaon so, and in this market you are the only one, you are the you are having almost 90 percent market share. So, if they do not come to you, they cannot go anywhere else. The second argument of DLF was that if they are not happy with me and in this market if if in Gurgaon market, if there is no other player, they can go to Noida, they can go to Greater Noida and CCI again said no, because the people, the most of your consumers are living in Gurgaon and if they want to buy an expensive house, they will not go to Noida or Greater Noida because that is a separate geographical market. People will not move uh, from their office to their home for half an uh, one hour, one and a half hour, two hours. So, in this case, the relevant geographical market again they say Gurgaon and the CCI impose around 700 crore rupees penalty on DLF and this case was upheld by Compet and Supreme Court and now DLF is paying the penalty. Okay. So, when you talk about the CCI, you need to understand CCI does not follow CPC, Civil Procedure Code or Evidence Law. CCI basically follows the principle of natural justice and the principle of natural justice is like the bias rule that there should not be any bias in the proceeding, the hearing rule that you should get the opportunity to be heard, the evidence rule that reasoned decisions reached after taking into account of all relevant facts. So, the, this is principle of natural justice, okay. though they are not bound by CPC like the civil procedure code or sometime even evidence law, but these are the basic things it, like they, they, if there is a bias, you know bias means that uh, suppose uh, the few members in CCI, they were working for that company or maybe they have a house in that, you know they have some property or some assets in that company. So, that can be a situation of conflict of interest or biasness. The hearing rule is that the CCI cannot decide anything without giving opportunity to be heard to all parties, okay, that is very important. Then CCI does enjoy the power of civil court. The power of civil court means summoning and enforcing attendance and examination on oath, discovery and production of documents, receiving evidence on affidavits, so all this power of a normal civil court. So, if you do not follow the CCI directions and orders, CCI can impose um, uh, first uh, financial penalty on you that can go up to 2 crore and 
still if you continue with your violation cci can start a criminal proceeding against you as just like a civil court cci can also do dawn raids dawn raids means when cci believes that you are involved in any anti competitive behavior just like income tax cbi they can come to your office and do the dawn raid and they can get lot of data information books uh, you know all the computers so cci does have that type of power also and they did in the jcb case they did the dawn raid and in some beer and dry cell uh, battery companies they also did the dawn raid so now how to mitigate the competition law risk so compliance and risk mitigation strategy is basically the treatment of compliance risk refers to the corresponding strategies implemented by an organization to deal with the risk so as a business manager when you do business obviously you want to win business you want to get more profit but at the same time you need to understand that by your behavior by your activities you are not violating any rules or regulations or any uh, provisions of competition law okay so competition compliance program this is interesting competition law compliance implies a systematic and active approach to run a business in compliance with the written legal and unwritten fair rules of competition and minimize the risk of infringement of law okay so this is very important you want to minimize the risk you know you you don't want that you or your company involved in any anti competitive behavior because cci can impose penalty on your company and i sorry i forgot to tell you cci can impose penalty on you also as an individual okay they can take money from your salaries okay so you need to be very careful a compliance program which is clear and comprehensive and implemented by the senior business management will go a long way in preventing the undesirable consequences of infringement of the law okay so how you should develop ccp in your company uh, the main objective should be to promote a culture of compliance that encourage good corporate citizenship and prevent violation of law so these are the three things and how to build a compliance framework as an enterprise has the responsibility to self assess whether its conduct uh, creates or poses concerns under competition law it is encouraged to develop and implement a ccp to ensure that an advocate uh, awareness of risk and an understanding okay so these type of things you should develop and compliance program compliance framework can take care of these three points the first is Uh, evaluating all its agreements market conduct and proposed schemes in the context of competition compliance so you need to see your agreements your documents your communication talk take the help of some competition law expert and that person can tell you whether it's allowed or not putting in a place a rigorous and suitably specific competition compliance system and third you should provide continuous training to your employees because sometime it happens that uh, uh, some business leader they don't want to violate any law but in absence of the knowledge you know they start doing something illegal which is not permissible under the competition law uh, i will summarize now all the time when you do a business you want to make profit okay so it's a game your competitor also wants to make profit so it's just like football game everybody wants to make goal okay so somebody has to win somebody has to lose so when you make profit maybe your competitor is losing money okay so there is always a rivalry or competition between you and your competitor and this is the requirement of the market then only you are always on toes you always produce good products you take care of your consumers but once you decide okay no we don't want to compete let's work together okay and then you start doing all these illegal cartel activities so that is prohibited under competition law second situation can be that you don't need a plan you are already too big and you don't want any competitor uh, you don't want any uh, friend 
because you are already very big. Okay. In that scenario, the competition law says that you have some special responsibility. Few things you cannot do. If someone is not dominant, that person can do. So, please try to understand very small difference. So, after DLF, lot of people move to CCI against the builders and they said, you know, please see the terms and conditions agreement. The same type of clauses are there in my agreement. So, please take action against my builder. CCI's answer was, yeah, I can understand abuse is there, but your builder is not dominant. So, in that scenario, if a dominant player is doing something wrong, abusing its dominant position, that is illegal under competition law. If someone is not dominant and if he or she tries to abuse it, CCI will not intervene. Why they will not intervene? They will say, okay, if someone is not dominant, it means that there are some other options in market. So, if you are not happy with him, like for example, I want to buy a house of 40 lakh rupees and I am not happy with my builder terms and conditions. I say, no, I, 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 th I think these conditions are abusive, one way, one sided, unfair. It means that there are maybe there are 10 builders in the market. So, I can go to them. Now, maybe one question comes to your mind, what if there is a collective dominance? Unfortunately, under European Union law, this is concept uh, collective dominance. In India, still we do not have collective dominance concept. So, we will see dominance of an individual party rather than the collective dominance. Okay? So, with these words, I will stop here and I just want to give you one advice when you go and join a company, please be very careful that your company is not involved in any anti-competitive behavior, any cartelization, bid rigging, market and all these things. And even sometimes your bosses may not be aware of this law. So, if you believe that, that there is something wrong, Please talk to your boss, to your senior manager and please tell them that this may create some problem for us, you know, for our company. Okay? So, that is the objective of this lecture. Thank you very much.